the active class, the last of the scout cruisers, mm, to be honest. Hmm, more of a Blonde class reboot than a actual new class, but they often get treated as a new class, hence they are here. The active class are a special group. They're free ships which manage to get involved in rather a lot of action for free ships which are really not thought about in much terms for World War One. And when I say they're not thought about, I mean that as ships go, as cruisers go, they're not the big ones, they're not the flashy ones, they don't get a lot of the screams and a lot of the accolades. Because there are the town class, there's the sea class, there are these other light cruisers that come in and immediately swamp them in terms of their presence. They have the firepower, they have the daring do, they're the new thing. Whereas these are the last of the old interim thing, not even the old thing, the interim thing. The thing which people were sort of thinking about might be a good idea, possibly, potentially. There's always a chance. The active class. A 25 knot turbine scouts. Now, here is the interesting thing. If the active class, having built at the original beginning of the scout cruiser program, if they had gone into service with the Royal Navy instead of the Sentinel, the Adventure and the Forward class, if it had been these vessels which had been coming into service in 1905, they would have been revolutionary. 25 knot speed, not enough of an advantage really over a Dreadnought, it's only 4 knots. But these vessels with their capabilities would certainly have been, Ooh, hello, you can do that, and it would have been noticed. However, by the time they actually come into service, by the time these vessels appear in the world in the flush, first flush of youth in 1911, 25 knot cruisers? Really? 25 knots? Mm. The Royal Navy is beginning to work on its battleship, which is hope it designed, which is hoping is going to achieve 25 knots, the Queen Elizabeth class. And it's working on battle cruisers, which are far and ahead, far and away faster. Destroyers are mostly starting to go faster. These ships are the beautiful productions of Pembroke Royal Dockyard. They're some of its last productions. Sorry. But they're not necessarily the ships they needed to be at the time. And if you're wondering why I suddenly looked down, I have a fluffy research assistant with me, and there was suddenly a chewing noise, and I wanted to check what he was chewing. It's nice to have a fluffy companion when you're talking naval history, but sometimes it is worrying. Now, These ships, therefore, can be seen in two lights. They can be looked at as small combatants who manage to achieve a lot despite their size in World War I. They can also be looked at the last gasp of a train of thought. A train of thought that hadn't run out despite probably it having been already superseded by another thought in the queue. But scout cruisers are like that. They allowed the Royal Navy to test a new plow bow, which was hoped to improve their sea keeping abilities and allow them to hopefully operate 
in the wider oceanic environment. They were using the new generation of Yarrow boilers. They could burn both fuel oil and coal. Again, you'd have thought, if you're going to be testing out oil fire, you're going to soon build oil-fired battleships. You'd be testing out oil-fired cruisers. Well, I'd have thought scout cruisers could have been the perfect ones to test out on. Let's be honest, you're only building a class of three. But no. Their main armament, as you can see from the stats, was very similar to that of the Blonde class. Ten single four-inch guns. Four single three-pounder guns. Two 18-inch rather than the two 21-inch torpedo tubes. Mm-hmm. Everything else is pretty much the same in terms of armour. Displacement. They are ten tons lighter. I'm fairly sure that's supposed to be 3,400 tons for the Blonde class. I lost a zero somewhere in my typing. I've only noticed it now. Unfortunately, the version of this video, which I recorded yesterday, has managed to corrupt on upload and won't re-upload. So, I'm redoing it. Luckily, I think the video for tomorrow did okay. 12 Yarrow Boilers supplied two Parsons team turbine, a team turbine sets to drive four shafts with 18,000 shaft horsepower for a top speed of 25 knots. This is compared to the Blonde class, which had a top speed of 24.5 knots. Main difference? Well, the Blonde class could achieve a range of 4,100 nautical miles at 10 knots. The active class, 4,630 nautical miles at 10 knots. It's amazing what a little bit less weight, a little more fuel oil, and a little bit of improvement in the hull design can do for your efficiency. If you think about it, when you're dealing in ranges of thousands of miles, you add 10% or so here, there, in terms of efficiency overall, that can make a very big difference in your, in your ability to ex operate at a long range. I also do wonder if the main weight difference is actually is down to just having those lighter torpedoes. 18 inch versus 21 inch torpedoes doesn't sound like a big difference, but that makes for a lighter torpedo. And if you're covering multiple rounds, that's a lot less weight overall. Especially when you realize the lighter torpedo needs only a lighter mechanism to support it because it doesn't weigh as much to move it. Although the Royal Navy tends to just use the same standard mechanism, so that's probably not going to affect much. And to be honest, the Royal Navy standard mechanism for moving torpedoes around on a ship is block and tackle and men hefting it. That's what it is at this period. It's also to an extent what it is in World War II, but we'll leave that to one side. The world is fun. They were actually slightly shorter overall than the Blonde class. Their draft was slightly shallower, and their beam was slightly narrower. So they were in every way a slightly smaller, slightly more efficient Blonde class, and they built three of them. They even had slightly less crew, carrying 21 less personnel. So, does that mean these ships are just Blonde class take two? Not really. The Scout class the whole way through had been a feature of an evolutionary style which would soon be see bear fruit in the 1920s and 30s with a swordfish. It's every next generation makes very small incremental improvements so that you end up with something which is incredibly reliable and incredibly viable. In some respects, you might therefore consider that the active class are the insurance ships. They're being built because of the leaps being taken with the town class and other light cruisers 
And just in case those leaps don't work out as planned, they have these in service. And they'll be definitely work. They might not work as startling well, they might not offer the improvements you're searching for, but they will work. And that's an advantage. Now, HMS Active, her career, well, she's ordered as part of the 1910 program. She's the temp ship of that name in the class. And as mentioned, she's laid down at Pembroke Dockyard as all of them. She's launched in 1911 by Lady Herbert, wife of Major General Ivor Herbert, MP. Very important gentleman to keep on side. Very, very pro armed forces and spending. And his wife launching a new cruiser certainly made the right impression. She's immediately assigned to the 4th Battle Squadron. And she stays with them till March 1914 when she's assigned as the leader for the 2nd Destroyer Flotilla. When World War I begins, her and her flotilla are assigned to the Grand Fleet. Second destroyer flotilla were detailed to hunt down a submarine, which they felt was being was around at one point when the Grand Fleet put to sea. And when not escorting the ships of the Grand Fleet, they spent much of their time doing anti-submarine patrol in Scarpa Flow. They became pretty expert at it. Or rather, pretty expert at doing what they thought was a good anti-submarine patrol. In October 1914, multiple reports of submarines led Admiral Jellico to send active and some of her flotilla to hunt down submarines in the Minch. Now, the Minch is... how do I put it politely? The Minch is a name for a strait in northwest Scotland. It's the one which separates the Northwest Highlands and the Inner Hebrides from Lewis and Harris in the Outer Hebrides. It's a kind of interesting area for a submarine to hang out. Let me explain why. On one side you have the Atlantic Ocean which has all the manoeuvring area of that. On the other side, you have the Minch, and Little Minch, and the Sea of the Light, uh, Sea of the Hebrides. And these areas, whilst theoretically offering safe harbour and protection from the storms, are also incredibly rocky, nightmares of navigation, and areas where, frankly, you can get your ship bashed in just through making a small miscalculation. In other words, it's not really a good area for submarines to operate, and not a really a good area for large ships to go and operate. Even the submarines which are underwater are going to be subject to massively vicious currents and tides, which means it's going to drain their engines. They're going to have to stay on the surface most of the time, and on the surface is not a good place to be if you're in that particular area, because the waves can get very, very high. In simple terms, I'm unsurprised they found there are no submarines there. I think possibly there might have been a submarine there, but, um, yeah. It weren't going to be there for long. Between October 1915 and January 1916, she was relieved of the second destroyer flotilla and was detached to serve just purely with the Grand Fleet. In May, she was attached to the flagship Iron Duke. And her role in the Battle of Jutland was ordered to screen, being ordered to screen the left flank of the Glaren Fleet as it approached the High Seas Fleet. This is why, during the battle, she only fired eight four-inch rounds during the entire battle. Please note, there is nothing wrong with that. You 
can turn around and go, well, all ships should be firing. No, her primary role was screen and repeating signals. Her role was not to go and get engaged in the fight and do the, the killing work. The Grand Fleet had enough ships for doing that. They needed some ships to hang back and protect their offside in case of German attack from that direction. And more importantly, they also needed to repeat their signals around to each other. And ships like Active were doing a very critical role in that month. Because if you don't have good communications, you watch how quickly a massive fleet like the Grand Fleet could fall apart. It really could. Remember, the Grand Fleet is formed in the High Seas Fleet in Hold World War, and it takes place at Nexus Point, where we have the skills to build all these massive large ships. We have the industry and the financial reasoning to build these huge fleets. And we have the beginning of communications which can make deploying these fleets begin to be viable. We haven't yet reached the point at which we can really deploy them over massive distance and coordinate them over a large area. So they're having to be actually kept quite confined, and that means visual repetition of signals is really incredibly important because the radios, etc., are not working. They get shot away quite easily, and they get disrupted by the vibrations of the ship's own guns, and all sorts of things are causing them fun. After the Battle of Jutland, she's assigned as leader of the 4th Destroyer Floated Up, based at Immingham in the Humber. She takes the destroyer flotilla out several times to meet up the Grand Fleet and try and protect the Grand Fleet, but they never encountered the High Seas Fleet again. Then she's assigned the 6th destroyer flotilla at Dover Patrol. She was present but not engaged when German destroyers attacked the Dover Patrol on the 25th of February and the 20th of April. By January 1918, she's at Queenstown as the flagship of the Southern Division of the Coast of the Island Station. Then she's deployed to Mediterranean, based in Gibraltar, by April. And was still in Gibraltar in December 1918. Then she went to reserve in Devonport in February 1919 and was sold for scrap in April 1920. She'd had a good career, and she was a valuable ship. She was. In contrast to Active, Amphion has a very high-profile career in some respects. Uh, she really does seem to get involved in a lot of random stuff. The Amphion is also, I have to say, both these ships, Active and Infian, were, uh, were um, when they were laid down and launched on the December, uh, by Mrs. Mundy, wife of the dockyard's captain superintendent, Captain George Mundy, uh, Jeffrey Mundy. Mm. Sorry. I always want to call him George Mundy for some reason. Anyway. When she was completed in March 1913, her first commander was the then captain, Frederick Dreyer, Lieutenant John Tovey was his first lieutenant. So this is this is already not sounding good for this ship. This ship is either going to end up beat up, bus uh, busted up, or crushed up. If you have officers of this later caliber as your first officers, you are a ship which is going to go in for a pounding. She lives up to that name. She's immediately signed a fourth battle squadron of the first fleet at the time. Then she's assigned to the first light cruiser squadron in the 18th, by the 18th of May. And she remains that squadron for a year before, and then goes to serve as flotilla leader for the third destroyer flotilla by the 18th of June 1914. But not quite sure when in June she does the transference. By the start of the First World War in August 1914, her and her flotilla were assigned to the Harwich Force. Okay, things are not looking good. Uh, defending the eastern approaches to the English Channel. And now she's under the command of Captain Cecil H. Fox. Oh, this is getting worse. There are certain names in the Royal Navy that if you hear them, you know the, sh the ship's going to be 
finding trouble. On the 5th of August, Amphion and 3rd Flotilla were on the North Sea, patrolling the area between Harwich and the Dutch island of Terschelling for German activity. At 10.15 hours, they spotted a ship in black, buff and yellow colours of the Great Eastern Railway steamers. These were ships that applied between Harwich and the Hook of Holland. Fox, being the kind of person which anyone named Fox is going to be, especially Cecil H. Fox, sends a couple of destroyers, Lance and Landrill, to investigate. Then another destroyer reports that the troll had seen a suspicious ship throwing things overboard, presumably mines. So Amphion led the flotilla to investigate. And, well, the ship started running from them. At 10.45 hours, Lance opened fire at a range of 4,400 yards on this vessel. The Koenig, uh, Koenig Louise, the SMS Koenig Louise, which had been converted to an auxiliary mine layer by the Germans. They planned to mount some, um, okay, 8.8, .8, or rather 88 millimeter, 8.8 .8 centimeter, uh, that's three and a half inches in Imperial guns on board, but they hadn't had time to do so. So her only armament was a pair of, let's call them lighter guns, just to be nice to them, let's be honest. Uh, the actual weapons were... <laughs> yeah, very much lighter. Pretty much machine guns. Anyway. And 180 mines. That's nice. So basically, your entire protection is being able to pretend you're something else. And, of course, a nice little paint job. On night of the 4th August, um, she had departed Emden and headed into the North Sea to lay the mines onto Thames End Street, which she began to, uh, to do at dawn. The destroyer's fire proved ineffective because, well, they're small ships and, frankly, trying to find a stable firing angle at that range against a target moving as high as fast as it can is pretty damn difficult. But they're gaining on it, so they're getting closer. But the thing is, Amphion doesn't need to get that close. Amphion gets to 7,000 yards and begins hitting the ship about 11.15 hours. By noon, that's roughly 45 minutes later, the Koenig and Louise is sinking and the British ships then start rescuing her crew. Five officers and 70 ratings. She probably had a few more than that before they started the engagement. They then decided to continue their patrol. And at 2100 hours, turned for home. Here is where the problems start to come about, because Fox was, of course, not really certain of the locations of the mines laid by the Quinning and Louise. He laid a course, which was seven nautical miles west of where he thought the mines were. He was trying to give it ample, ample room. However, he'd thought the mines were to one side, to the east of where they found her. Actually, they were to the other side. So, the Koenig and Louise gets revenge. <sighs> Amphion strikes a mine and that detonates under her bridge at 0635 hours. This sends her set her forecast on fire, broke the ship's keel. Um, when Lynette, attempted, a destroyer, attempted to tow the cruiser, her upper deck cracked. And she was hogging badly. Now, hogging is an interesting term. Now, when a, sh when a ship sags, it's described as sort of doing this. It's bending in the middle and breaking like that. Hogging is when it's doing the reverse. 
when it's almost arching like that. And it's to do with the dynamic stress and the, well, the, the cargo loading and time induced stress, all the, these things that have an impact on what's going on. But basically, it means the structure is severely damaged and the ship's about to come apart. That's the short of it. That's the short of it. It's not really a good thing for a ship to be hogging. And so Fox orders his crew to abandon ship. Then her forward magazine exploded, which threw one four-inch gun into the air that actually narrowly missed the net. One of the shells managed to burst on the deck of the destroyer Lark, killing two of her men. And the only German prisoner rescued from the Queen of Louisen by that particular ship. Amphion then sank in 15 minutes. The explosion had caused another uh, one officer and 131 ratings to be killed in the sinking. Plus, a large number of the crew rescued from the Quinnigan Louise also went down. Not quite sure how many that is because the records don't really survive. They got the revenge, but at the cost of, them, at the cost of themselves. And this is actually a German paper's drawing because, frankly, some of the drawings were... Um, especially some of the British ones. Absolutely atrocious drawings. I mean, absolutely. The, the, the ship looks nothing like the ship does in real life. The Germans get an actual decent drawing of the ship. They actually do go and consult a copy of James or Brassies, find an actual picture of the class, and actually do a decent drawing. The British get something which looks like it's out of, I don't know, boy's own history of 1890s ship design. Rant over. And then we have Fearless. Okay... So, <laughs> this feels like I'm negating, uh, narrating a story about a certain... Because HMS Fearless lives up to her name. Now, she was assigned to the first light cruiser squadron when she commissioned. And then she was sent to serve... as a leader of destroyer flotilla in July 1914. She was transferred with that flotilla to the Harwich Force at the start of the war. And in charge of her flotilla, under the command of Commodore Reginald Turret, we know life is not going to be good, leading then first and third destroyer flotillas to the vicinity of Bucco off the East Faroesian Islands, Phyllis and her flotilla encountered nothing particularly of note. She was with First Flotilla. Third Flotilla, of course, sunk the Coen Louise. But they did manage to accidentally sail over the minefield. Yes. Phyllis managed to accidentally sail over the minefield and get out in one piece. However, on the 17th of August, they made up for this because, um, well, they found the Strasseland. Now, this is an interesting scenario because Strasseland, of course, was one of those lovely Magdeburg-class Magdeburg light cruisers. And when you consider she's armed with 12 4.1-inch guns, could carry 120 mines, she's... Um, an interesting vessel. An interesting vessel indeed. The interesting point about this, though, is that Fearless, uh, Fearless's lookouts misidentified her as first an armoured cruiser. So, the captain ordered his ships to fall back and wait for assistance because he didn't have enough destroyers and he Fearless couldn't take an armoured cruiser on its own. But as a group, 
once he'd caught, ball, called them all together, the party was on. However, as soon as they realised, hang on, it that is not an armoured cruiser. That is a light cruiser. He decided to take whatever he had available and go, charge! But... The Germans had also done a misidentification, and they'd misidentified the distant ships, as, uh, distant ships as an entire cruiser squadron, not a cruiser and destroyers. So they decided that they would also get out of there. <sighs> oh, fun. Poor Fearless. <sighs> this point, she gets to go and take part in the Battle of Heligoland Light. And again, find some German light cruisers. She likes light cruisers. What can I say? The Battle of Heligan Blight is an interesting time for many. And I'm going to expand this one quickly. Why is it whenever I do the expansion, it decides to go and find a new slide? Now... The Battle of Heligan Blight in 1914 is a British attack on the German patrols. So basically, it's the Harwich Flotilla going after their... The Harwich Force going after their counterparts. And they are supported by a submarine flotilla and the 1st Light Cruiser Squadron. And also, they have some battle cruisers as well, along for that extra fun. Now, what happens is the Germans get taken by surprise, and 3rd Destroyer Flotilla ha manages to have real fun knocking out many torpedo boats before the SMS Stetland, which was supposed to be looking after them, made her appearance at 0800 hours to try and spoil the fun. Ha Fearless was unsurprisingly annoyed by this. Fearless found this rude jumping in and destroying what they were... They had a perfectly enjoyable morning going on, not for the German torpedo boats, but that destroyers were... Torpedo boat destroyers were destroying torpedo boats. That's what they're supposed to do. They were getting to live their reason for living. Admittedly, this was very upsetting, as mentioned to the Germans, and very upsetting to probably many of the crew of the German torpedo boats, but still, torpedo dis boat destroyers were getting to destroy torpedo boats. This is what they are designed for. This is their reason for being... Interrupting that is just rude. Fearless, therefore, decided to fire at Stettin, and managed to hit her about five minutes after she engaged... Knocking out one of her guns before the German ship decided to disappear back into the fog, deciding that Fearless, well, in a future run of various other ships which would do this, was one of those ships who really didn't like you attacking her destroyers. Again, the Royal Navy has a habit of ships which take attacking their destroyers very, very fundamentally in a bad way. Um, we have Warspite at Narvik. We have Renown bumping into Nisenau and her sister. Scharnhorst. And we, of course, have the tribal destroyer's reaction to the German sinking hood, which they normally escorted. And fundamentally, their officers believed that if they had been with Hood, the Germans would never have sunk her. Because their flotilla would, of course, been engaging Bismarck and Prince Jürgen so thoroughly during the fight that the Germans would never have been able to manage to get their lucky shot because they'd have been too busy going, where are the torpedoes? Where are the nutters? And are they firing baked bean cans at us? I know. I'm being a little bit hyperbole here, but the point is, this is one of those fights which doesn't get talked about enough in the true nature of it. You do not have stabilized guns. You do not have big ships involved. This is a short-range, dirty fight between unstabilized guns, crewed by sailors, 
many of whom will have been reservists, regulars, or very few of them will be people who haven't been in the service for a long time. The new conscripts, the new national service people, aren't really there yet. These are reservists, these are regulars. And the sheer skill it takes to actually hit a target under those conditions with gunfire is, frankly, amazing. It's amazing that they achieve what they do achieve. At 08, 12 hours, they turn west, disengaging before any further German cruisers make an appearance and really do cause them trouble. But at this point, Fehler spots the SMV-187 and opens fire and doesn't manage to hit her. VA-187, in an experience which is going to be repeated later in several battles in World War II and even battles in World War I, was able to disengage, thought she was successful, and then wandered into the path of two light cruisers and several British destroyers and went, oh, lucky me, and was sunk. They then tried to recover crew. In the meantime, and it's always nice, the fact that so many people use that phrase, in the meantime, when describing British actions, in the meantime, as if, well, oh, that was no consequence, of course, that's just, in the meantime. However, as is normal when you have certain name people, Turret himself, of course, was there, and was in his flagship, the Arafusia. Now, Arafusia, of course, was one of her, was a light cruiser. She was um, fighting the Fronlob, Fronlob, which was another of the, well, one of the Gazelle class light cruisers. And so Fearless decided to rendezvous with her, her at 0855 hours to help her with her withdrawal. So she's helping out a fellow ship. Then the, again, what is it about these German cruisers that are just so rude. The Strasbourg turns up at 10.35 hours. Spots our fuser and thinks, Ooh, I can open a fire on that. Then realises that she's got Fearless and com several destroyers from both destroyer flotillas with her. And um, decides that life would be better elsewhere because the sheer volume of fire coming at me is definitely going to not be harmonious to a long and happy life. Later on, the Colne appears. That's, of course, a Kelberg class light cruiser and has a similar reaction to that experience. The em significant emotional event that is realising you are facing the bulk of two flotillas of destroyers and a light cruiser, well, a scout cruiser, which is defending a light cruiser and doesn't consider, has the name Fearless and doesn't really have a crew who consider anything other than the full throttled attack to be what they're supposed to be about. Strasbourg tries again. 11, 10 hours. It obviously had gotten over the significant emotional event of earlier. And again gets driven off, but Tirrit decides to ask for Beatty's battle cruisers to come and give them a little bit of support. They decide to turn south at 11.35 hours, and first destroyer Fosilla finds the SMS mains. Another Kohlberg class light cruiser. They didn't have Phyllis in support at that point, and extended most of their bad torpedoes in the earlier battle. They thought they were going to be in trouble. However, First Light Cruiser Squadron then appeared over the horizon and went, Don't worry, boys, we're here. At Mains very quickly found a fog bank. Unfortunately, this fog bank meant that she who had been damaging earlier Fearless's destroyers 
came very close to Fearless and the rest of the Harwich Force. And Fearless, again, very protective of her destroyers, uh, disabled Main's rudder, and slowly she begins circling. This is never a good scenario for a German. When your rudder is disabled and you are circling, this is the point to hoist the white flag. It helps prevent what can come next. Now, the British ships didn't cease firing until 12.25 hours. And then Colne and Strasbourg came into sight from the north, thinking, okay, there's two of us, we can win this. And so fearless, three destroyers decided to go north to engage them. But they're probably thinking, ah, we can win this. Which point the battle cruisers hove into sight over the horizon. Which point they're probably thinking, Oh, um, I think I left the kettle on at home. I'm going to go check with that kettle now, and I will see you later. Coleman, the Ariane, another, an another German gazelle class, were actually um, sunk later that day thanks to this. And the Harwich Force, with that support, resumed its pursuit home, uh, fearless even taking Laertes, a crippled destroyer, in tow. That is the Battle of Heligan Blight, from the small ship's perspective. It's a case of keep. Stumbling around in a fog bank, you'll bump into each other often enough, and something bad will happen. They were good ships, and they served well. They were not the ships that were probably wanted at the time, and this is fearless after colliding with some marine. But they were the ships which were built. They're insurance for the light cruiser program. That's what they really are. But they still do well. They're never going to get the attention they deserve because scout cruisers come to an end. No one's really building scout cruisers after this. Not in the same mould. Not as light ships which are designed to be pretty much just big destroyers. And the point I often make about them being big destroyers is surely they should have just given them more torpedoes. The amount of time these ships find themselves as destroyer flotilla leaders. Give them a bigger torpedo hold on that. Two 18-inch torpedo tubes? Two single 21-inch torpedo tubes? Two single 18-inch torpedo tubes? No. You can do better. You need to do better. You should want to do better. But the trouble is, they were designed to be scout cruisers, to be getting the information and reconnaissance. And then, when you get in the North Sea, you need to start doing reconnaissance in force. And that means your battle cruisers take on that role. Your battle cruisers really have the role of being the force of the reconnaissance. And now your destroyers and cruisers are escorting your battle cruisers. And the trouble is, these ships aren't going to keep up with your battle cruisers. They could have been. If they had been properly designed, they could have been the cruisers which could keep up the battle cruisers. And that would have made things kind of interesting, especially if they'd had a heavier destroyer on it. They would have been very useful scouts, but they would have been, in many ways, forerunners of what would become the tribal program, etc. Fast gun vessels, which also have a heavy torpedo armament. That would have been pretty scary. And that actually is today's question. Is there any ship in the World War I period that you think fits that description? And if they had been built as that, fast, heavier destroyer torpedo on it, let's say at least equivalent to a destroyer, but preferably destroyer plus 50%, along with their guns, 
and a speed of, hmm, let's say 28 knots. Let's not be too excessive, just 28 knots, but that could have been achievable. How big do you think they would have been? What kind of capabilities do you think they'd have provided, and do you think they'd have been worth it? Because I think these were good ships, and I think they were worth it. But I think they could have been quite easily so much more. So we've got coming up. We have the Battle of Coronel, which I should be recording later today. Then we have shortcomings with the designs of early aircraft carriers, which will of course come out on Saturday as a long patrol. And again, hopefully we'll be recording today. Long patrols, of course, are recorded videos. And because I was got so many questions, here is a well, as you noticed, December. See next slide. Here are the Christmas topics. Bold, are the lives over the Christmas period. So we have Thursday the 1st, we have German heavy cruisers of World War II. Sunday the 4th, we have Brew Ships 95. Thursday the 8th, we have Patron 68. Sunday the 11th, we have Brew Ships 96. Thursday the 15th, we have Patron 69. Sunday the 18th, we have Brew Ships 97. Friday the 23rd, we have the last live before Christmas, which is the Soviet Navy 1918 to 1991. I know, very Christmassy themed. And then on Christmas Day, we're hoping I'm hoping it's going to be the HMS CS Haydn Tribal Video Class video. Of all the footage put together. That's fun to edit in. And then Thursday 29th, we have 1860 to 1960, 100 years of gun cruisers live. So basically that's the entire year of the cruiser. In a live. And I have recorded, I'm going to record a long patrol as well to come out on the 3rd of the 1st of January 2023 for you all. And on Sunday the 1st of the 1st, 2023, Brew Ships 98 will be live. Yes, New Year's Day, I'm going to be doing a live for you. There will probably be about four of you. Who will be on here. But I thought I would do a live. Because I'm not. If I tried to do a live on Christmas Day. I would get slaughtered. But usually. By. New Year's Day. My family has reached the point. Where we're all going. We love you all. We love you all. We love each other. Very very much. But. We're not used to this much time together. We're just not used to it. So. Go off to your own spaces and do your own things for a few hours, okay? Please, for our continuing existence and continuing love of each other, go do that. That is what we do. So, I will be doing a live. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed.